，欢迎观看网易公开课 A Talk 英语访谈，我是主持人饶顺。今天做客我们节目的嘉宾是来自耶鲁大学物理学教授，美国艺术与科学院院士，同时还是公开课耶鲁大学公开课程基础物理的讲师 ，Dr. Ramamurthy Shankar 博士。有请。Hi, Mr. Shankar. Welcome to Nedis. Welcome to A Talk. I'm Very very happy to be here. It's such a privilege to have you here. Well, not as much as privilege for me to be here, <laughs> because uh, ever since I was a little boy,、mm -hmm. of course I knew about China. I heard about the long history between the two countries,、oh. how Chinese ambassadors、uh, Huan Song and Hua Yian came to India、mm -hmm. to exchange ideas on education. Wow! So I'm coming thousand years later to do the same thing. It's kind of like a, a dream. Country for you this time? Yes,、uh, everything is amazing for me because I have imagined it, and now I can actually see it.、Mm -hmm. And、uh, I've been traveling for two days since I came, saw all the big attractions.、Mm -hmm. Sometimes on my own, I was telling you the things I like. Taxis in Beijing are the best. <laughs> They, why, why are they the best? Because you don't have to argue with them. You don't have to bargain with them.、Uh -huh. Then、uh, it's also quite cheap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Reasonable price. Yeah, and I like the bicycle system you have,、mm -hmm. where you can pick up a bike and you ride somewhere, you drop it off somewhere else. Yeah. I like that system. Very convenient to ride a bicycle. Yes, and in Beijing.、Yeah. people are very helpful because I got my wife and I got lost in Tsinghua campus. Uh huh. We did not even know where we lived, <laughs> and yet some young guy walked with us for twenty minutes, and finally figured out. Where I lived and took us there. <laughs> That's my example of Chinese hospitality. I see. Anyway, welcome, welcome to China. You know,、uh, we are also quite curious about your、uh, your teaching experience. At your teaching at Yale, Yale has been has been one of the most prestigious universities in the world. It's like a dream place many students love to go to.、Uh, can you tell us what it's like teaching, working at Yale? Yes.、Uh, So I've been at Yale for forty years now. Forty years. Yes.、Wow. Uh, I came there in my late twenties.、Mm -hmm. Then I never left, and I love the place.、And、if you ask what I like,、uh, I like the students at Yale.、Mm -hmm. They are very broad,、uh, interest in many different things,、mm -hmm. and I learn from them just as I teach them.、They're、very curious,、mm -hmm. and Yale as a university is very supportive of teaching. It's not true in all the places.、Uh, some places think teaching is a headache.、Mm -hmm. uh, Yale thinks teaching is a duty and a privilege.、Mm -hmm. And if you are very famous and you say, "I'm famous, I don't want to teach," they don't accept that. They、mm -hmm. say, "If you're famous, there's even more reason for you to be in the classroom in、mm -hmm. front of people."、So、everybody at Yale has to teach, and I like to teach. And、uh, when I first came to Yale, I was writing my first book on quantum mechanics. Uh -huh. And a lot of places would say, "Don't write a book when you're young. You know, it's a time to make your reputation in research." But they encouraged me to write the book. They, in fact, financed the cost of typing up the book and producing it. And they value teaching. If you're a good teacher,、uh, the chairman of the department knows you're a good teacher.、Mm -hmm. uh, promotions are based to some extent on teaching. I see. Yeah, I like I like that aspect of Yale.、Uh, so I've always. Enjoy teaching, and I'm glad to be in a place that values teaching. Values teaching. Yeah. Very good. Very good. We all know that also the motto of year is,、um, if it's translated into English, is called light and truth. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Can you tell us how that is applied at Yale?、Uh, that's a, you caught me with surprise. I haven't thought about how it's really applied.、Uh, we read the motto.、Mm -hmm. uh, I would say every educational institution、mm -hmm. has to be about light and about truth. Mm -hmm. Light, so you don't hide from anything, and truth, so you say it like it is.、Mm -hmm. uh, it's particularly important for academic people、mm -hmm. to have that freedom.、Mm -hmm. And this system of tenure in America, where you give a job, call a tenured pro professor, they cannot fire you for saying anything.、Mm -hmm. You may say something that's popular with your university, with the government, with your colleagues. It doesn't matter.、Mm -hmm. You are free to say it, and it that's part of light and truth. I And、see. I, the university does respect that freedom. Freedom.、Okay. I talk now. I tell you whatever I want. I'm not worried if the president of Yale is listening to me.、Mm -hmm. uh, in 
my case, I'm not worried because I have only nice things to say about Yale, but even if I didn't, I wouldn't worry about it. That's the aspect of life at Yale and many universities I really like. Mm -hmm. And also the truth, as long as you are telling the yeah, truth. Yeah, telling the you know, when you teach, uh, you think everything you say is true. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to lie in physics, but you can be wrong in physics. Mm -hmm. What if a student points out in the lecture that what you said is wrong? What are you going to do? Uh, you can tell him to be quiet, <laughs> or you can think about it and say, you know what, you're right. There you're teaching them something more than physics. Mm -hmm. You're teaching them that the number one principle is academic honesty and integrity. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not right, I should be willing to accept that. And I try to show that even in these online lectures. Mm -hmm. Once in a while you'll find I'm making a mistake. Yep. And the students point it out and I make a big fuss over that because I want them to feel that's good. I want them to feel, sometimes they try to catch me when I'm right and I tell them, sorry, try again. <laughs> but they always want to catch me when I'm wrong and that's a good thing. That's part of truth and light. Very good, very good. So you like to encourage students to yes. challenge you, right? Yeah, you want to be challenged because look, I've been teaching for 40 years. After a while, the subject gets boring. You know, the same Newton's laws, mm -hmm. the same laws of quantum mechanics. What makes it interesting is the students are different every year. Very good. They have different questions every year. And sometimes you say something for the 35th time that you think you know, and some student points out something that you had never thought about. Oh. So that's why class participation is very, very important. Mm -hmm. You have to encourage students to take part in the class. I see. A very good approach to encourage students to answer questions. Although right. look, at, look at the subject from different perspectives. Yeah. You never know, maybe they, they can help to extend the subject yep. to discover new areas yes. of field. That is, you're absolutely right. Field. You yeah. tell them that your job is not done when you learn something. Yeah. Because one day you have to contribute to knowledge. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'll be learning the same thing, right? But each year there's new stuff to learn. Where do you think it comes from? Exactly. You it, want the knowledge to keep upgrading yeah. itself. You have to feel that it is a work in progress. and work should progress. be constantly modified, not by somebody else, but by you, the guy in the classroom or girl in the classroom. Yeah. Very good, very good. That's also why, you know, before you came, your name actually preceded you. Uh -huh. yeah, you are a year open courses. They were showing on, on our platform, that is online open courses. Actually, there are two of them. One is the Fundamentals of Physics 1, and the other one is Fundamentals of Physics 2. Yes. And I checked the data the other day. Um, uh, they have accumulated millions of video views. That shows how popular you are and how popular your course is. And also, without a doubt, your course is one of the most popular international courses on our platform. Oh, th thank you. I think I'm grateful to Yale for uh giving me the opportunity to tape those courses. Yeah, can you tell us how did this happen? How did this year open course happen? Uh, well, first of all, the fact that I was even teaching that course mm -hmm. is not in the normal course of events because I was normally teaching advanced courses. Yeah. But uh, when I became the chairman, I did not have to teach. So I didn't like that because I like to teach. So I was waiting for some excuse to get into the classroom. You love teaching. <laughs> yes. Uh, so one of my colleagues who were supposed to teach introductory physics, he fell ill in the summer uh -huh. and the classes are beginning in a couple of months in the fall. Mm -hmm. There was no one else to take his place so I said I will do it. Mm -hmm. Then I started teaching the course and I found that I enjoyed it a lot more than I expected. So I taught it a few times. Uh, the students liked it and that's when our dean, uh, Peter Salovey, who is now our president, he said we would like to record it as part of our Yale online courses. Mm -hmm. it, the, one of the, it was the first science course they taped because they were not sure there's any interest in watching a science video. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they realized that's not true. There's a lot of interest in science videos because science is universal. You can talk about the electron in New Haven and you can understand in Beijing because it's the same electron. Yeah. So physics has universal appeal. So that's when they decided after some time to record the second part of the course. Mm -hmm, very good. So because that, yeah. of the success of the first one. They yeah, they really realized that it's okay to put a video out there in physics. Mm -hmm. And it's been very helpful for Yale because people know we are strong in science. Mm -hmm. uh, people know that we care about teaching. Uh, people, we want people to apply to Yale. 
You yeah. said it's a very coveted institution, right? Yeah. Every student wants to go to a good institution, but every good institution wants a good student. Mm -hmm. So it goes in both ways, and this is our way of letting people know if you come to Yale, this is what your experience will be like. Very good, yeah. It's really satisfied our curiosity, because lots of them were really, before that uh, Yale open courses, we were always want, we were wondering what would it be like sitting in the, in the classroom at Yale learning courses. Right, in fact, they kept the atmosphere as natural as possible. Mm -hmm. There is no special studio, it's a regular classroom, regular blackboard, regular mistakes made by the prof, mm -hmm. regular corrections, same jokes, same laughter, mm -hmm. everything was recorded on tape. That is really, you're right, there is no real difference between being in the classroom really and watching good. the video. And I'm glad a place like Yale is willing to offer this to the whole world for free. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't cost us anything. Uh, we are always sure we, students will come to Yale anyway. Yeah. Why not share it? And when I was a young man in India, I was trying to learn physics on my own because yeah. I was an engineering student who wanted to study physics. Uh -huh. And I didn't know where to learn from. Mm -hmm. And if such a course had been available at that time, it would have been very helpful to me. Yeah. But now I know that kids all over the world learn from that. Yeah. Not only kids, housewives, Housewives as well. They say, look, I wanted to do physics, but I got married, I had kids, I had no time, but now when my kids are in school, I want to go back and learn physics. Uh, yeah. So I'm learning from this course. So we don't know who will watch. Mm -hmm. It's not always some student trying to get into college. Mm -hmm. It could be a retired uh, doctor who always likes physics and wants to learn. So it's like anyone who's interested in physics, yeah. right? There are, there's always a place where they can really yeah. uh, continue their study, continue right. with, their, with their interest. But uh, you got to do the work. Yeah. You cannot just learn all the fancy words. I tell them yeah. the words mean nothing because they depend on the language you're using. Mm -hmm. Only ideas are the same. Yeah. So I tell them, uh, by all means, take the course, but just don't learn the fancy terminology. Try to understand what's behind it. Yeah, what's uh, behind it what's behind uh, the laws of physics yes. and help them with the daily lives? Yeah, well, uh, I'm not that helpful with daily life because mm -hmm. uh, I'm a theoretical physicist. Mm -hmm. And if you want something to be repaired, you shouldn't come to me. I'll probably break it. So I'm more interested <laughs> in physics just because it's a very beautiful structure. Uh -huh. uh, art is a beautiful structure, symphonies are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Physics as a subject to me is equally beautiful. It's beautiful because it has nothing to do with human beings. It's nothing to do with day-to-day -day politics or power struggle. Mm -hmm. It is something permanent, which is there, mm -hmm. which is operating <coughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. And we have managed to somehow find out what the laws are. Mm -hmm. And we find the laws are written in mathematics. Mm -hmm. And mathematics is, in some sense, a human invention. <coughs> so the, the mathematics and the physics, they together. <coughs> they go together and if you think that you can do you can do physics without mathematics, mm -hmm. it won't work. It's like saying I want to sing in the opera but I don't want to learn any language. You cannot do it. This is the chosen language and you have to learn it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but once you learn it, the rewards are very high. Mm -hmm. because sometimes the mathematics will tell you something will happen that you will never think of on your own. But it comes from simply solving the equation. The equation will tell you besides everything you put into it, there is something else implied by these equations. Uh -huh. If you look in that corner of the sky, you will see something. And you look there and you see something. For example, that's how one of the planets was discovered. Uh -huh. They found out the planets were not moving according to the Newtonian laws. Mm -hmm. Then they figured that's got to be another planet which is disturbing these other planets. I see. It helps you discover new things. Yeah, then they figured out where should the new planet be to produce these effects. Then they figured out where it is and what radius it's at. They point to the telescope, there it was. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you explain that? I mean, why should it have to be that way? Yeah. What will you do if the planet is not there? Who are you going to complain to? <laughs> but the fact is, it works. To me, the amazing thing is that such a thing exists and it works and we found out. Using the language of physics and mathematics. And mathematics. This is what I try to talk about in my course. It is not so much about how to compute things. Mm -hmm. It is important. If you don't want to compute, get out of physics. You should be ready to work hard, ready to compute. But to stop there is to mix some of the excitement. Mm -hmm. It's like learning the notes in music. 
but you listen to the symphony, it's more than the notes, it's something else that you appreciate, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you should take some time to appreciate how amazing it is. Very good, it's amazing, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, and I, I feel it every time I teach. Mm -hmm. I never get tired of uh, how wonderfully everything works. I mean, every time I teach it, I derive the laws, then I say, this is how the equations work. Then I say, when you look at the real world, it follows this. And no matter if it's the 40th time, I'm still amazed. Wow. And I feel that, and I think that's what I relate to my students. Yeah, I can really sense and feel you have the strong passion. Yes, and that you, you have to communicate. A lot of people who took this course are not physics majors. Yeah, yeah. Some are going into medicine, some are going into chemistry, some are going into humanities. Yeah. But you don't have to be an English major to appreciate Shakespeare. You understand it, somebody, mm -hmm. same way, you don't have to be a physicist to appreciate the structure of physics. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more important to explain physics to people who will not be in physics. Mm -hmm. Because one day they will work in the government and they will decide whether we get funding or not, right? I see, I see. So you have to tell the other people why what you're doing is worth doing. Mm -hmm. It's even more important to con convey this to non-physicists. Excellent. That's good. That's why you are, your passion and you also your interpretation of physics really uh, benefiting meaning so for users out there. And I'm saying even if they don't go into physics, mm -hmm. it'll be helpful. Because one day you're working in some policy matters, right? Yeah. People talk about energy, people talk about radiation. Mm -hmm. You should know what they actually mean. Yeah, what's, what's kind of uh, behind them? Yeah, you should know at least something. If you've never seen it, uh, people hear the word radiation, they'll say, oh, we shouldn't have nuclear reactors, that's radiation. <laughs> well, you should realize, yes, that is always radiation. What's the probability that will affect you? Mm -hmm. Is it small? Is it zero? It's never zero. Mm -hmm. If you're worried about something that will occur with non-zero probability, you will do nothing. Yeah. Life is a calculated risk where you say, this is the probability. Should we do it or not? Then you decide. We can take the risk. Those things you learn by doing physics at least once in your life. It really makes me even more interested in physics now. Well, I'll see you in my classroom next year. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Good. Good. Okay. Excellent, excellent. And also, um, you also wrote textbooks, right? Which are of, of the same names as, the, as your courses? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, after I finished these lectures, I thought I was done. Mm -hmm. But uh, the person who was very instrumental in this, her name is Professor Diana Kleiner. Kleiner. She said, why don't you write a book based on these lectures? Mm -hmm. Because when you talk in the movie, uh, sometimes the handwriting is not clear. Sometimes you don't say it right. Mm -hmm. Then you correct yourself and you go back and change it. She said, how about a book in, in which everything is presented clearly and the equations are written legibly? Mm -hmm. Then you also think more and write everything more accurately. Why don't you do that? Mm -hmm. uh, they had the transcript for all my lectures. They gave me the transcript. Mm -hmm. So I tried to write the book as if I'm still talking to you, wow. the way I was talking to my class. So it's based on the transcript. I will always talk about me as me and you as you, so that we're still having the same conversation the same in the book that we had in the classroom. I see. And I've written four books, and I think I have the, had the greatest pleasure writing these two books. Mm -hmm. Because here I, I relived my teaching experience. In the others, it was sitting and writing the equations. Here it was like doing it one more time with a class. Yeah, yeah. So they do one more time, on, they do the, do the online study first, then read your books. That would really Yeah, they can the, do that. That's correct. The whole, whole course. That is right, right. Very good. In your opinion, what, what makes your, your books different from, from other books of physics? Uh, I, my, one of the reasons was, a physics book, at least in America, were getting very expensive. Mm -hmm. They would cost about $200 for the two parts. Wow. So my books, each one is sold for $20 to $25 on Amazon. Uh -huh. And I like that when Yale Press said, we can produce it for 25 bucks. I said, good. What's the use of writing a book that people cannot afford to buy? Yeah. Secondly, you can actually lift my book with one hand. It's mm -hmm. very light. And it's in two parts, so you take the first part in your backpack for one semester, then the second one, second part. Mm -hmm. uh, I drew all the drawings myself so that the cost of production is not very high. Wow. So you put lots of energy and efforts. Yeah. Into I think what books. happened was the big books are very good. They have a lot of information. They have a lot of pictures. But sometimes 
in the class you have to throw away a lot of this stuff. You cannot cover all that material. Mm -hmm. So you have to cut it down from that size to that size. Mm -hmm. And I said, why not write a book of that size from the beginning so that everything there is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. So just go to the basic idea and ask yourself, this chapter is this big, but if I had only 30 minutes, what will I say that will convey the main ideas? Then you just put that in your book. Mm -hmm. I think that was my attitude in teaching, that was my attitude in writing the book. Very good. To cut the chase, to go to the essential. Get to the point, the and then uh, take your time to elaborate on the point. Mm -hmm. And you will find there is enough time. Sometimes when I first started teaching the course, uh, I modified it because previously it was for three semesters, uh -huh. not two. Mm -hmm. And yet it did not have relativity, it did not have quantum mechanics. These are the two big revolutions from the last century. And they were not in the course because they said we don't have time. Mm -hmm. So then uh, I worked with my colleagues and I decided we will teach it in two semesters and we will also do relativity and quantum mechanics. So that's one other feature of this book which is in there. Mm -hmm. So I really encourage um, the users or our audience yeah, to, to get a chance to, to read your book. Actually, yeah. yes. And also it's a good combination to read your book and also learning your course online. And that is on open courses, that would be uh, super beneficial to them. Yeah, I think each has its own advantages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. And can you tell us about your personal experience? You have been teaching at uh, Yale for 40 years. That, that shows how dedicated you are in, in teaching in, 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 in your field of physics. Uh, can you tell us when and how did you first have your interest in physics? Ah, so uh, I grew up in India. Mm -hmm. And when I was 16 or 17, I took an entrance examination to what's called the Indian Institute of Technology. It's very famous institutions. There used to be five of them. Uh -huh. They take only 200 people in each institution for the entire country. Mm -hmm. So you have to study and study and study like you do here for the exam. But mm -hmm. if you get in, you are set for life. You guaranteed a job, guaranteed an income. Uh -huh. So I did that and I became an studying for electrical engineering. Mm -hmm. I never thought about whether I like it or not. I just did it because I was an obedient son and a good student. I studied whatever they told me to. Mm -hmm. But in my second year, my brother who was teaching at Cornell University sent me uh, two volumes of lectures by Richard Feynman. Mm -hmm. So Feynman's a very great and inspiring physicist and lecturer. Mm -hmm. So I started reading those books just for fun. And somehow, something happened uh, in the middle of that book when I said, uh, this is what I want to do in life. Wow. So I told my father, I want to stop being an engineer. I want to be a physicist. Uh, he said, look, why don't you be more careful? Get a degree in engineering when you will get a job. If mm -hmm. you still like physics, you come back and tell me and I will support you. Mm -hmm. So then I learned uh, all the topics by myself and with the help of a friend. Mm -hmm. Then I wrote the graduate record exam, GRE. GRE. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in those days, GRE was very important. Mm -hmm. If you did well, you got admitted to a lot of places. So Berkeley admitted me. Wow. So that then I went there and I said, I'm tired of engineering. <laughs> I want to do the kind of physics that is absolutely no use. What is the most useless part of physics? They said it's got to be elementary particle physics. It has nothing to do with the real world. So that's what I changed. I studied elementary particle physics. So I got my PhD in that field, very different from engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, then I went to Harvard for three years where I uh, was in a, something called the Society of Fellows. It's a gathering of postdoctoral fellows. Oh, so you also worked at Harvard? Yes. As a student? Or a no, it is after PhD. After PhD. Ah. They let you do whatever you want for three years. Ah. And they select about eight people every year and you have to do nothing. You can do what you like. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Yale. Uh, then I just never left. I see. You find, you find your like, uh, destination. Yes, no, your, absolutely. Your, your place. That, was my, that is where I was meant to but be. Also Harvard and uh, Yale are the, the most uh, the two most prestigious universities in the world. You are at both. You have worked at both places. Uh, yes, they, I mean they are our rivals, but uh, I respect them. Uh, I really? respect. You think they're rivals? 
Yeah, of course, they are always competing, They're competing in everything, science, football, whatever you like. <laughs> yeah. uh, but you, you can respect your competition, right? So I yeah. respect the people at Harvard. First of all, they gave me three years at their own institution, mm -hmm. which helped me a lot in my career. I just happened not to work there, but to work at Yale. I but see. I would send my good students there if I wanted to. If they were good, I would send them there. So the competition is really good to help them. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we get, our, get, uh, we get yeah. our students and faculty from there, and we try to send them there. So we respect each other. Yeah. I see. And my next question is also related to that. What are some differences have you found out, you know, uh, working at Yale and also uh, work on? Uh, well, the differences are, as I saw it in my own life, they may not be universal differences, but I found mm -hmm. uh, I was much more relaxed at Yale when I went to Yale. Mm -hmm. I felt a lot more pressure at Harvard. Uh, I see. Yale, there was less pressure, which was better for me. Uh, where, where did the pressure come from? Just that uh, the need to prove your abilities constantly. Mm -hmm. At Yale, uh, I did not feel that pressure. For me, it was better that way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes some people perform better when there's pressure, some people perform better when there's no pressure. Mm -hmm. For me, it was better under no pressure. And in terms of teaching, uh, in those days at least, uh, teaching was not a priority at Harvard. Mm -hmm. But I found at Yale, it was always a priority from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But things have changed, like Eric Mazur is here, he's from Harvard, he spent so many years thinking about teaching and how to improve teaching. Mm -hmm. So I imagine things are very different now. But when I first moved, this is one thing I noticed. I see. Are there any other words you'd like to say to the, uh, your, your students, actually, millions yes. of students that yes. you may not have met them before? Ni hao, xi <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. And also, are there any way, how would you like to encourage, encourage them to study? Yeah, physics I would say, get involved in yes, the, physics, like any subject, mm -hmm. requires a lot of work. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're not ready for the work, do something else. But second thing, be your own critic. Don't fool yourself into thinking you understood something when you didn't. Don't stop, because sometimes when you're doing research, something doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because it is wrong. Oh. It's not your fault. But if you don't learn to question everything constantly, just accept everything, you may be a student, but you will never do research. Mm -hmm. If it's right, eventually it will make sense to you. So don't, uh, don't accept things without questioning. Then talk physics with your friends. It's okay. You don't have to do everything alone. It's a collaborative effort. Uh, you learn better when you talk to people. If you look at the collider in Geneva, the Large Hadron Collider, there are 2,000 people working on a project. So it's okay if five people work on a project. You learn a lot by discussing physics or anything with your friends. I would say these are the three things to become a good physicist. And finally, make sure you like the subject. There is no point in doing something if you don't like it. Make sure you like it. Exactly. It won't be hard. Very good, very good. So even though you don't want to become a physicist, like you mentioned previously, there's always something you can, uh, the knowledge from physics you study. Yes, I think so. Yeah, we all learn things which are not in our field. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, I learn about the cell, the embryo, because in some sense it affects my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, a physics will affect your life, so be aware of it. And even if you don't become a physicist, when you do physics, you learn a few things which are important. You learn how to make responsible predictions. Mm -hmm. When you say you have a theory, it doesn't mean you woke up and dreamt of something. A theory is a very responsible way to speculate what will happen. Yeah. It's got consequences. Mm -hmm. which can be tested. If you cannot test it, it's not a theory. Mm -hmm. And if you test it and it doesn't work, you have to be ready to give it up. And if it works, even your opponents have to accept that you're right. Uh, so these are aspects of scientific thinking that many people do not know. Mm -hmm. They say, well, I talked to this physicist, he believes that, the other physicist says, no, the opposite is true. Maybe nobody knows what's going on. That's not true. In any living subject, there will be a period when it's not clear who's right. It's not because anybody is lying, because it takes a while to figure out who's right. And if you're in a subject where you can actually establish who's right to everybody's satisfaction, that's not like many other things in life. Mm -hmm. 
Many other things some people will say is good, some people will say it's bad, they can argue, they will say let's agree to disagree. In physics you cannot agree to disagree because there's only one answer. Only one choice. And in the end everybody has to agree. That's what I like about physics. In your opinion, do you, uh, what, what do you expect that's going to happen in the development of, of physics in the future? Yeah, uh, the physics is evolving a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, I used to be in particle physics. Uh, particle physics in the old days was concerned mainly with finding more and more fundamental particles mm -hmm. by hitting protons and electrons at harder and harder forces and higher and higher energies. Mm -hmm. There I think we have reached the limit now. I think the Large Hadron Collider is about the most powerful machine <coughs> I expect to see in the next 20 years. Maybe they'll build something more. Mm -hmm. But particle physics is very relevant in other areas like astrophysics. For example, in the early universe, you had much, much more energy than you can ever produce in a machine. Mm -hmm. uh, new particles appear. Uh, strings may be relevant. Strings may not be relevant in daily life or even at colliders that can be relevant in the early universe. Mm -hmm. So if you look at particle physics in that way, it's very relevant. But other areas, right now I work in condensed matter physics. That's the physics of superconductors and semiconductors and so on. Mm -hmm. There, it's a very different kind of challenge. In particle physics, you don't know who are the fundamental particles. You don't know what the forces are between them. That's what you're trying to discover. Mm -hmm. in, the, in my new field, like uh, superconductors, everyone knows who the main actors are. They're just electrons. Everyone knows the force between two electrons, given by what's called Coulomb's law. So we know the laws, we know the particles. So what's there to do? What happens is, if you've got two particles, you can figure out everything. If you've got a million, million, million particles, they will do something that you cannot simply guess, given the basic laws. They will do something very surprising, because when you put a large number of particles, because of the largeness, there's an unexpected quality to what they do. Mm -hmm. So a superconductor was a big mystery. Why does the material have no resistance when you cool it below some temperature? It was unknown for 50 years. 50 years is a long time in physics. Yeah. Bohr tried to solve it, Feynman tried to solve it. Nobody could figure out what it was. Then Bardeen and Cooper and Schrieffer, they figured out what it is. It is all standard physics, but you still couldn't figure out why, given those laws, this was the implication. For example, given the laws of physics, I can tell you how a cell would work. Mm -hmm. Given how a cell would work, in principle, I can tell you how you would work. But I don't claim to know I can figure out how you are thinking just because I know the laws of physics, because there's many steps you've got to go through. And if you add the base simple laws, the complexity of the phenomenon, uh, there are unexpected things. So that's the area in which physics will never go out of style. Mm -hmm. And finally, astrophysics is in a very interesting stage now. Astrophysics used to be a subject where not much was happening, but now it's very vibrant. Mm -hmm. Surprises are occurring about the expansion of the universe, the accelerated ex expansion at certain stages has been discovered. What's behind it? Should you modify the Einstein's field equations or not? That's a big mystery. There are particles like neutrinos, which are hard to see in daily life, but they can play a very big role in astrophysics. So it's a very lively field. Uh, I don't think we are going to run out of questions in the near future. Excellent. I can, I can predict that's going to be more amazing things happening. Yes, absolutely. In the, in the yes, if people physics. think it is over, uh, they are not thinking straight. And also we encourage the youngsters, more youngsters who are interested in physics to get involved in this field. Yes, I would say one more thing, uh, if they go to graduate school, mm -hmm. don't jump into your area of research too early. Uh -huh. Don't yeah. think you know what you want to do, you don't. Mm -hmm. Try to learn a lot of other things. Because very often the most interesting thing lies at the intersection of two areas. Mm -hmm. uh, only a person who knows two areas can solve that problem. You cannot yourself into one thing. No, you one. cannot. You will get a job, you will make a living, but you will get tired after a while. Mm -hmm. This way, if you go to a conference or seminar, listen to what other people are saying. Mm -hmm. If you're a graduate student, try to get an office with people from another group. Mm -hmm. Talk to everybody because then you will learn different ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. They will tell you about a problem they cannot solve, but you say, wait a minute, we have seen something like that in my field. Then you collaborate and you figure Very it good out. Collaboration. Yeah, that's the fun part. Good, good. Very interesting. Okay. So it's like 
Uh, there are some notion, old notions like uh, physics can be boring, but after talking to you, I say physics is very lively and interesting. Very good. And very practical and useful. Uh, yes, it's both useful excellent. and beautiful. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much for, okay. for taking the interview. It's it a real pleasure to have well, you. I'm very happy to be in China. Yeah, let's say goodbye to the, to the audience okay. together, shall we? Goodbye, audience. Yeah. 感谢大家观看今天的 A Talk 英语访谈，请持续关注我们的节目，我们下期再见，拜拜，拜拜。